And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, this was God talking to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, turned down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Tell your neighbor, a still small voice. So it was, when Elijah had it, the Bible did not tell us that this was God, but we know it was because of what Elijah did. And when Elijah had it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel are forsaking your covenant. Can we just stop here? And Romans chapter 8 verse 14. The Bible made it very clear to us. Can you do Romans 8 14? All those led by God's spirit are God's sons. The KJV says, as many as are led. But you need, they mean the same thing. But this is simpler, right? All those who are led by God's spirit, they are God's sons. Are you led by the spirit? Then you are a son of God. That's all he means. Praise the Lord. I thought you would celebrate God for that. So for a few minutes, I want to speak to us as I end and conclude this year in God series on understanding visions and prophecies. Shall we pray? Eternal Father, thank you for your word because the entrance of your word give light and understanding unto the simple. As simple folks, we have come today to learn at your feet. I make my tongue the pen of a ready writer and I write the word of life even upon the spirit of man. Thank you, O oh God, because after now we all shall be better people who we'll walk according to your counsel and purpose for our lives. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. You can have your seat in God's presence. So this evening I'm speaking on understanding visions and prophecies. Tell your neighbor understanding visions and prophecies. All right. Now I want you to ask a question. I want to ask you a question today and I would like you to probably ask your neighbor in 20 seconds. What is the most important need of a believer? Ask your neighbor, what is the most important need of a believer? Get an answer. Praise God. Some people are smiling. I know we are not doing close off. We're just trying to talk. Praise God. Uh -uh, talk now. Babe, talk. All right. So, you have 10 seconds. Have you gotten an answer? So, let me put this off your record. Uh, let me put it off your book immediately. Some people will say, Looking good, makeup, dress, clothes. Some will say shelter, Mary Kay. Uh, some folks will say a good trouser. Some people will say water. But we're not asking for the most important need of man. We're asking for the most important need of a believer. A man may say the most important need is shelter and water. But for the believer, the greatest need of the believer is hearing God and being guided by God. The most important need of a believer is being guided by God. Because in life, we are going to be faced with decisions. Many men in scripture says are in the valley of decisions. So you are going to stand in the valley of decisions and you are going to be asking yourself, what do I do? What place should I stay? What location should I be in? And I've told us over the course of a few weeks now that it is important we have it in a bag, as a background that God speaks to people. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 14. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. If God will lead you, you will gain victory. Surely, the Bible says you will need guidance to wage war, and victory is won through many advisors. Psalm 24 and verse 6. God leads, and in order to move us forward, God wants to guide us, tell us what to do so that we can move forward, so that we can live where we are presently and step to a place even of abundance. And in this month of going forward, it is important we understand that one of the primary principles of God to make us to go forward, to make us to advance, is by giving us a word. Is by leading us by his word. Uh, is by guiding us. Uh, 
Bible told us in Psalm 37 and verse 23. The Bible says the steps of a good man, they are ordered by God. That means there are wicked men in the world. But if you are a good man, your steps are going to be ordered by God. Psalm 23 verse 1, the psalmist said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me out beside the still waters. If you do not hear the voice of God, you will not be guided by God. It's important. He also said, He leads me in the path of righteousness. Isaiah 48 and verse 7, Thus hear the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And the Lord who teaches you to profit, who lead you in the way you should go. Therefore, there is a way every believer must go. But you will not know the way to go if you will not hear the voice of God. The Lord will guide you continually. Isaiah 58 verse 11. Psalm 32 verse 8. The Bible says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will straighten your path. And that translation says, it will guide you. In the path to follow. Do you need a path to follow? Then you need God in your life. And I would like to proceed here by saying to us that the primary means by which God leads us is the word of God. It's the word of God. It's still the primary means. I know I've spoken about several means by which God speaks. But the primary means God speaks to his believers is the word of God. The word of God. Have you ever read scriptures? I was, I was listening to a message this, to this, um, this morning. And again... It still occurred again. The man of God still said the same thing. Have you ever read the scriptures before? I mean, you've read that scripture thousands, a dozen times, uh, and then the same scripture, and then suddenly you read it again, and then you say, Ha! Now, God just spoke to you through that verse. You just saw that voice in a new light. You've been reading that same verse. You have read it a million times. Probably you can even quote it. I tell folks, many people don't even know what John 3 16 means. You have not gotten to the end of John 3.16. Why? Because you are familiar with it. And as I told us before, familiarity is a bane to revelation. Because you are familiar with a verse uh, does not mean you have gotten all that can be revealed in that verse. So you get to an eureka moment. A moment where you just find a light in the scripture. How did you get that? Because God just breathed upon his word. Because light came even upon the word of God. So God guides us primarily by the word of God. And that's why I tell believers, you need to put inside of you the word of God. Tell someone to put inside of you the word of God. Why? Because it will guide you. How can a young man keep his ways? By paying attention to the word of God. My word have I, your word have I eaten in my heart. Why? That I may not sin against you. Because when sin comes, that's not the time to not sin. Oh, 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 should I do it? The word of the Lord will pop up like a popcorn in your heart. Say, no, you can't do that. That scripture says it's not possible. You can't do that. So it's important we do that. Now I want to say to us, that the primary source of guidance, again, is the word of God. You see, many times, the believers seek for the spectacular. But God does not always stay and walk in the spectacular. He shows himself in simple and ordinary ways. I've seen people who say, you know, that guy asked me out. I'm not sure he's the one for me. I say, praise God. He said, but God should speak. And they're looking for a spectacular way. A vision, a prophecy, something gigantic, something very awesome. Like wind just blows and they say, Ruth, I am the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. I mean, it sounds so awesome. You look for something spectacular so that God can say, somebody say, if God is calling me into the ministry, he must wake me up in the middle of the night and say, hi, 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 the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. And then the thing will be echoing, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. The spectacular. But God walks in ordinary ways. He speaks to us in ordinary ways. A still small voice. So in concluding, you remember 1 Kings 19 that we read? The Bible says the Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the raging storm. Why? The Lord was just in a still small voice. And therefore, you must pay attention to the first three things we spoke about. And if you don't have those messages, you're coming here for the first time, you can go to the back and just ask for a man called Elite, Elite, Elijah, Adishina, whatever. Just ask for him. Any of the three names is still one person. All right, so just talk to him. You know, we spoke about whose voice am I hearing talking about dreams? We talk about human spirit, the inner voice. God is that you speaking. And I was talking about your inner voice. And then we talk about Holy Spirit, the inner witness. Today I want to talk about vision. I, you know, I felt like stopping and not talking to you about these things. But I feel that if I don't talk to you about these things, some people will still say we want visions. All right, so let's start. The question many people ask today is, does God still speak through vision to people? 
Does he still speak in vision? But the answer is in the Bible. Joel 2, 28, the scripture told us. And it was very clear in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. It says, shall come to pass in those days, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And when we open to young men, and young men shall see visions. And in the reality of it, of what he prophesied, in the book of Acts, Peter said it, that the spirit had now come in Acts chapter 2, 14 to 21. And it is imperative we understand that one of the signs of, it, of our days is that God speaks in vision. Praise God. So why will God speak to you in visions? I want to say certain things about visions here. And I want you to write them down very quickly because you are not paying for this. Praise God. Hallelujah. So just, just write it down. Amen. First thing is that God leads a person or a group through vision. God can give a person or a group a vision. When God leads a group through a vision, there will be an agreement by persons in that group that this is God leading us. Praise God. It's not that one of them will just put it on others and say, ah, I saw a vision. They will sense it in their spirit. They will feel that is what God is calling them to. There will be an agreement in that group when God leads in through a vision. How do I know this? Acts chapter 16, 6 to 9. The Bible says, the spirit suffered them not to enter into a land to preach. The spirit did not agree for Paul and his team to go there. And the Bible says, after that time, Paul had a vision, a Macedonian vision. And the Bible says, God told them. This is verse 6. Can we go to verse 7? The Bible says, but the Spirit suffered them not. Now verse 8. And they passed by Mysia, came down to Troas. Verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul. You see, Paul saw what? Is he a dream? He saw a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying... Come over to Macedonia and help us. Verse 10. And after he had seen the vision, immediately, look at the word. After who had seen the vision, the singular verse, he. That means he saw the vision. But we endeavored to go into Macedonia, surely gathering that the Lord had called us. So they all agreed. One person saw the vision, but we all agreed. We said to ourselves, we are sure in our spirit that God is actually leading us even to that place. Now, that's very important in a group. You can't just choke people with God said. If he said it and they are spiritual people, God will convince and bear witness as to the genuineness of your claims. Can I say that to someone again? You know, many of the time you just say, no, God, God said that's what we should do. And because you said God said, we all kept quiet. I, mean, I don't keep quiet because somebody said God said. I used to when I was in school. You know, I, I used to say that time that God said is the end of every argument. But we have seen seen that men say when God did not say anything. So it will convince us that that is what he's saying. Number two, visions of God can be given to any person. In scriptures, we see people who are not born again receive a vision from God. Can I say that to somebody again? It doesn't mean that you are born again, that's when you will see a vision. It is not necessary that the person is born again, but many times it leads to salvation. If you are not born again and you see a vision then it will lead towards salvation. But believers genuinely are the ones who should see a vision. A very good case is the case of Cornelius. Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verse 1 to 6. Bible says he was, uh, Acts 10, a centurion of the band called the Italian Bad, verse 2, a devout man. He was just devoted, he was religious. He was not born again. Why? Because after the ways of the Lord were shown to him, the Bible says he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's when he became born again. Amen. So, you see, they had this experience, though they were not born again. Another thing you will find, because in Acts chapter 10, 44 to 48, the Bible told us about how they became born again. Another man you will see that had a vision of God is the man by the name of Paul. Paul called Saul of Tarsus. Scripture told us that on his way to Damascus, he saw, he saw Jesus. But those who are with him did not see anything. They only had a voice. So he saw a vision. I'll still explain to you what those vision means. Now, number three, a vision can state clearly what to do, and it can be symbolic. A vision can state clearly what you should do, but a vision can also be symbolic. There are clear visions. There are what I call clear visions. And it can also be symbolic, symbolic visions, meaning that their meanings are hidden. An example of a symbolic vision 
is Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10, verse 9 to 21. Bible says he was hungry and then he saw a vision. And Bible says that when he saw the vision, what you call a trance, is also a vision. He saw a vision. And then what happened? They rove shit to him and then kill and eat. And say, I can't kill this thing. I can't eat it. It's unclean. I'm, I can't eat things like this. So he woke up and he was telling himself, what could this mean? Do you understand that? That means he did not understand what it meant. And then what happened? If you, you have to go to verse 20, 21 to get what I'm saying. And then what happens? After he saw the Holy Spirit told him. He said, arise therefore and get thee down and go with them. That was nothing. Verse 19, go to 19. 19 and 20 tells us what actually happened. The Holy Spirit now told him the purpose of the vision. Why Peter thought on the vision? Don't forget, he said a trance. He had a trance. Now verse 19 says, when Peter thought on the vision. So it's the same thing. Do you understand that? The Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. That means if he had just stopped at the level of the vision, he would not understand what that vision means. So you still need the Holy Spirit to tell you when it comes to symbolic visions. Don't worry, some of us till we die will not see visions. It's not a cause. So, but we're just saying this for those who see them. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. It doesn't mean you are not born again because you are not seeing visions. <laughs> if you are, can hear God, you have the witness of the Spirit and you go with your Bible. That's all you need. Praise God. Number four, what I want to say is that there are three kinds of visions. The first one is what you call a spiritual vision. In a spiritual vision, you see with the eye of your spirit, not the physical eye. An example from scripture is in Acts chapter 9, 3 to 8. That was the Paul's conversion. The people had a voice. Acts 9, 3 to 8. They had a voice, but they did not see anyone. And Bible says that, uh, Paul was blinded, so he could not also see anything physically. But then he saw a vision of God. In Acts 26, 19, Paul called it when he was talking, he said, uh, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So he called it an heavenly vision when he was talking to King Agrippa. So what you find is called, a, you see, in that kind of realm, what happened is that your eye of understanding is made to see things. Your spiritual eye. You may be looking at Mr. Benga here, but your eye is open spiritually. And then God is showing you certain things. By his grace, I've seen those things before, so I know how it works. So spiritual vision, sometimes you are praying and God opens the eye of your spirit and then you begin to see certain things. You see certain things. Some people will say, I've seen demons before. I've seen devils before. Not that they saw it physically. They saw it with their spiritual eye. So Bible told us that only Paul saw Jesus. And when Paul was writing his epistles, Paul said, I was the last that saw the, the reason Jesus. Why? Because it was a reality to him. So spiritual visions are visions you see when your eyes are closed, but God opened your eyes and you see certain things. I want to say some things to you, but I'm not foolish sure I want to say those things. Praise God. So let's go to number two, which is called trance. There's something called trance. You know, the Greek word for trance is the word ecstasy. It's where you get the word ecstasy from. You know, there's a drink called ecstasy, praise God. Have you taken ecstasy before? Raise your hand. Raise it in church, I'll do deliverance for you here right now. Praise God. All right, so, you know, ecstasy is what you take and then you lose your senses. Praise God. You lose your mind a little. Amen. And that's what it means, actually. It means a displacement of the mind. That's what it trans is. It's, it's like you are suspended. Your mind is no longer in control. You can't control yourself, but your body is there. As I'm saying some of these things, some of you will be listening. Ah, that's the experience I had. Praise God. It's called a trance. So you are somewhere. It's like you are sleeping, but you know you are not sleeping. But your body cannot control things because your mind has been taken out. It has been displaced. And then you see certain things. And you see certain things. Acts chapter 10, verse 10. Bible says Paul saw a trance. He was in a trance. Your physical senses are suspended. I remember I stayed, I had woken up, I was sure I had woken up, I was on my bed, sometimes last month, and then I lied down. That was beginning, before I preached those messages on revival, and then I lied down, and then I saw the state of the church in a trance. I saw a building, and then I saw that the building had so many crazy things, animals and all of that, inside the building and all of that, all of that, all of that, all of that. Let's, some things are not okay for men to listen to, so just let's round it up. We just saw things and all of that. 
and all of that. And that was where I was praying like Paul, and then God said, that was what happened. And the Holy Spirit explained the trance to me. Amen. So you see a trance also. So there's what is called a spiritual vision. There's what is called a trance. I've seen those two before. I've witnessed those two before. Praise God. And then there's the third one that is called an open vision. An open vision is when your physical senses, your spiritual senses are alert. You can see it. You open your eyes. You can see it. Feel it like you've seen this man. And then Jesus just walking into the door. Praise God. That's what's called an open vision. I mean, Kenneth Hagin said he saw that. Jesus came into the door. And the Reverend George has seen an open vision before. I'm not praying for one, but I've not seen any before. I know people see them when they don't pray. So stop praying for vision. Say amen. You just see it when you see it. If you don't see it, live your life. Praise God. Just live your life on the word of God. Uh, Reverend George said he was in his room and then Jesus just walked through the door. He said the door did not open and then he sat down. And then he began to talk to him. So that's an open vision. You, you are not sleeping. He said, I've taken too much ecstasy. It's not, I've taken too much drink. You are aware. And then the person comes in. He said, what happened? The door did not open. How did you come inside here? Praise God. And then you begin to talk even to God. Praise the Lord. So there are open visions. There are spiritual people who see things like that. I, I'll tell you about somebody who saw what you can call an open vision. Um, not an open vision. Who saw the spiritual vision. Uh, this person, somebody you have seen before probably, I will tell you the person's name. The person was very into certain occultism and all of that, and it was very powerful. The lady was very powerful, and then she sat down in her room, and she told me, she said, I said, what that brought you to church? You are this powerful. You don't need God now. Abby, what do you think? And then she said, no, you know, I, I was in church, and I, I've never been to church and all of that. She said she sat in her room, and then she just saw Jesus. She just saw a vision, she just, just in a table. And Jesus just told her, you need to go to church. You need me in your life. You need to go to church. And he said, the whole thing lifted. And it kept happening until the lady came to church. You see, that leads again, like I said, into salvation. Praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor, are you still with him? Or is he saying certain things? You will get it. Tell, tap your neighbor and say, you will get it. Tell him, you get it now. You get it now. You get it now. All right, so what God promised us is guidance. God does not promise us visions, prophecies, and things like that. Can I say that to someone again? What God promised us is guidance. He does not promise us visions, prophecies, and other things. And seeing vision is not a proof of your spiritual maturity. Can I say that again? Seeing vision is not a proof of your spiritual maturity. Because unbelievers see visions. So, because some of us, no sooner have we said this now that you will begin to pray, Agana, Ayana, Apollo, see me, show me vision, or I die. Listen, it's not a proof of your spiritual maturity. Praise God. John 16, 13 to 14. But when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Who guides you into all truth? Visions? No, the Holy Spirit. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive that which he will make known unto you. So let me say the following as it concerns vision. We don't have to wait on the Lord for a vision. God may lead us through a vision or he may not. Number two, though you can never pray up a vision. Ah, I'm running. You caused it. Number one, we don't have to wait on the Lord for a vision. God may lead us through a vision or he may not. And then number two, Though you can never pray up a vision, you can pray for guidance. Can someone, someone listen to me? Though you can never pray up a vision, you can pray for instruction and guidance. And that's what you should pray for. Guidance and instruction. Not say God in our witness. Oh God, oh God, vision. Oh God, prophecy. Praise the Lord. Number three, as it concerns guidance, know that you can never pray up a vision. Visions are 100% God-dependent. Visions are 100% God-dependent. It doesn't have to do with your maturity. It doesn't have to do with your spirituality. It is God that does it. If I'll tell you the truth, certain times I eat pandediam and then I'm not feeling any spiritual and then I have a vision. And then the days I feel like I'm the mountain top, praise the Lord, and then nothing happens. Nothing, absolutely nothing. I need to walk by the word of God. Amen. Under eight, 99.5 percent of the time, as a Christian, you will walk on the word of God. You will make decisions 
based on the word of God. Now let's move on to prophecies. I feel like underlining right here, right now, that God's first primary way of speaking and talking to you is to talk to you about your matter. That's God's primary method of dealing with us. God's primary method is to talk to you about your, met- about your matter. He is not a gossip. That's why I do not tell, I tell believers that if you are a son of God, you should not be a gossip. Amen. Tell your neighbor, if you are a son of God, you should not be a gossip. Because God is not a gossip. He will first of all tell you about your matter. That's his primary way of dealing. He doesn't speak to second party about you without a cause. His first way is to speak to you. That's number one. Number two, therefore, if God is speaking to someone about you, it is based on two things. If God is speaking to someone about you, it's based on two things. Number one, he's confirming what he has told you. To assure you that he's the one speaking to you. And then number two, to get a message across to you. Because you yet cannot still hear him. So if God is telling me about you, it's because you can't hear him yet. That's why he's telling me. Are you listening to me? The simple gift of prophecy. That's what we call the simple gift of prophecy. You find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3. Bible says, uh, he that prophesies speaks word, edification, exaltation, and comfort. Don't let this bamboozle you. They mostly mean the same thing. If you check the Greek, the Bible dictionary, edification means to edify, to build up. The word exaltation means to build up and to comfort. And the word comfort means to build up and to exalt. Did someone get that? So it's basically telling you the same thing. So the reason people prophesy, godly prophecy comes to exalt, to edify, to build up, to comfort. Do you understand that? The Bible says in 6, 14 of the book of Ezra. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Agai, the prophet. How did they build? How did they move? How did they prosper? By prophesying of people. We live in a day and in a time where people prophesy bad things. But Agai, the prophet, this biblical way is that prophecy should do other things. Having established this, I want to quickly tell you Elements uh, and things you need to note about prophecy. Number one, time is the test of every prophecy. Tell your neighbor, time is the test of every prophecy. Somebody say you will not get into next year. <laughs> when you get to January 1, 2020, that means that's a false prophet. Is that not so? Time is the test of every prophecy. Time. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. So the Bible says, do not be alarmed. Tell your neighbor, do not be alarmed. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. That's what he says. If a prophet proclaims the name of the Lord and it does not take place, it doesn't come true. That message is not from God. Number two, prophecies are given sometimes to instruct a group or a person what to do. Israel were always led by prophets and prophecies. Isaiah prophesied concerning the people. Ezekiel prophesied to those who are in the land of bondage. So God always leads his people, instruct his people, or instruct a person by prophecy. Number three, we must learn to test all prophecy. Any prophecy or word that does not agree with your spirit, discard it. First John chapter 4 verse 1, Bible says test all spirits. You must test it. No matter who a man is, if he tells you anything and he does not agree with your spirit, it doesn't ring in your spirit, let it go. No matter how awesome a man is, he can get it wrong because we are still all humans. So when I say a thing to you, even if you have never had it before, your spirit man, like I said before, that searches all things, must have sensed it somehow. It should not sound so new. Because they are fake prophets and prophets does not mean there are no genuine ones. I believe there is no other ministry office that has, that has been attacked by the devil like the ministry of a prophet. Many of us sit here, you don't even believe in the ministry of prophets. You don't. 
When they say, Allah, Nanyama, hi God, hi the Lord is here, say, let us be going home. Why? Because of the havoc some of them have caused in your family? Because of the havoc some of them have caused in the family of your loved ones? Some fake prophets have gone and they have put your family members in fear and in bondage. And because of that, you believe that there's no true prophet anymore. Allow me to say to you that if there is anything called counterfeit, it's because there's a genuine one. If you buy a product and you say, ah, this product, ah, this, it looks like the original. <laughs> you see, when you buy Nikki, say, ah, wow, they have turned the heat to high. Praise God. See, it's supposed to be Nike. That's to tell you the original is Nike. The fake is Nikki. But if that guy had done his own and call it Pookie, now it's no, it doesn't look like any of the original. His logo is different. Then it's the original because it's what he made. So when we talk about counterfeit, it is because there is an original. Allow me to say to you that because there are fake prophets, is a proof that there is a genuine one. So you need to stand with the word of God. How do you test it? Test it by the purpose of that prophecy. That's number four. The purpose of Christian prophecy is to build up. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 3. Acts 15, 32 to 33. Can we see that? Acts 15, 32 to 33. I've spoken about building up, edifying, comforting, and Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves. Exalted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. You see that? You see that? Because they were prophets, they could do this. That's what prophets does. It's not that they prophesy and you can't sleep at night. That does not edify anybody. Praise God. All right, numbers six. Prophecy should exalt the spirit of Christ. So Christ has a spirit. And it must align with the dictates of the scriptures. Prophecy must align with the dictates of the scripture. I can't find any place in the scripture where prophecy is given on how to invest financially. But God can speak and warn his people about it. Therefore, when sometimes you, you want to invest money and then you are saying, you can't read the Bible and say, should I? Because you won't find the name of that company there. But prophecy can come. It can guide you. Do you understand that? But it should agree with your spirit. Read the word of God. Prophecy should glorify God. I love Revelations 19 and verse 10. The Bible says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So prophecy must come therefore to elevate and defy Jesus. If it doesn't do any of that, increases the devil apart from Jesus, then there is a problem. Is someone listening to me? Very important. First, Corinthians, First John 4 and verse 2. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus' is Lord has come in the flesh, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. It should align with the scriptures. Somebody talked about a prophecy that a woman had, and, and the prophecy comes, la, 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 la. You, you married drunk. That is not your husband. That's not your husband. The person you married, that's why you are suffering. God will have you leave the man and go and marry Peter. Now listen, the problem with the prophecy is not that, you know, it sounds good now. He married wrong, so leave. Praise God. But the problem with the prophecy is that Peter is married. So God is going to dissolve, does that agree with the word? Whatsoever two have joined together. So it doesn't agree with the spirit of the scriptures. So there are tenets in scriptures and it's important for you to follow them. In conclusion, you can, can I have the music team? In conclusion, why God leads his people? It determines the method by which he communicates his will to them. God leads his people, but he communicates his will to them. Number two, if God does not communicate with you any other way, stick to the word of God. Tell your neighbor, stick to the word of God. When a child of God seeks to know the voice of God, God will leave the person in his perfect will. And then finally, certainly the Lord leads. There's no need to cast lots. And there's no need for a fleece. Do you know people do that? I told you when it started. Somebody cast lots and then the team played Jimmy on him. The only time these things were done in scriptures was before Pentecost. The question is, are you born again? Ask your neighbor, are you born again? Have you experienced salvation? then God leads. 
and God can lead you. Look at your neighbor eyeball to eyeball and say, God can lead you. And he wants to lead you. Allow him to lead you. I believe God. Keep preaching. Are you tired? I believe God that he will lead you. He's speaking to you right now, right here, and forever. I declare into your life that your ears are open, that your mind receives instruction from God, that you know God and you know his leading. In Jesus' name, amen. Come to the end of the service. Can you stand on your...